A pathetic picnic. Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 to 21. It was an impossible task and the disciples knew it. 5,000 men plus unnumbered women and children and what had they got between them? They scrabbled around and they could find just five bread rolls and a few pilchards. What a pathetic picnic. How inadequate was that? Well, their first instinct was to send the crowd away. Tell them to go home, Jesus. But Jesus was having none of it. No, you feed them. But, but, but it would take more than a year's wages to feed this lot, and we've got next to nothing. Really? said Jesus. How about you start looking at what you have got, and not at what you haven't? It's an interesting idea, isn't it? Now each year as we celebrate harvest and uh, other times of year when we hear disaster appeals that come in through our TV screens, our hearts stir in compassion for the hungry. We want to do something for them. But when we see the hungry crowds and hear yet another appeal, part of us does feel that we face an impossible task. It's easy to feel that there's nothing we can do in the face of such incalculable need. Yet we know we must try. Today I want to focus on another kind of hunger altogether, a spiritual hunger. And believe me, as Synod Evangelist, I know how overwhelming a task meeting this need appears to be to so many of us. The call to share our faith, to engage in evangelism and witness, well, it leaves many of us, if not terrified, then at least feeling so very, very inadequate. We don't know what to say. We don't know where to begin. We worry that they'll ask us difficult questions and we won't have the answers. We think we don't have the training or even the right to speak. In fact, many of us don't think we have much to offer at all. We fear we do not have what it takes. We look at our pathetic little picnic basket and then out at the crowd all around and we panic. But let's look at what you have got, not at what you haven't. That was Jesus' approach to his disciples then, so let's follow it for a moment today, shall we? We may not have five loaves and two fishes, but what do we have in our lunchbox to bring to Jesus so that he can feed the hungry crowd today? Perhaps we may have more than we think. Let me suggest some of the little things that you have in your basket that Jesus can make into a banquet to feed the thousands. Firstly, you have an invitation to offer. And note, I didn't say a welcome, I said invitation. We spend a lot of time uh, talking about welcome in the United Reformed Church in recent years. Well, that's good, but it only goes so far. What good is it if we're a really welcoming church, but no one ever comes through the door? We need to be an inviting church as well as a welcoming church if we're going to be effective at all. I was listening to Michael Harvey as he led a workshop recently on creating a culture of invitation in the church. In it, I heard him say that invitation or evangelism is really quite easy. It's all down to one question that all of us have in our basket. Would you like to come to church with me? And yet research has shown that 80 to 95% of people in our churches, when asked to invite others, have absolutely no intention whatsoever of doing so. There may be many reasons why we're reticent to invite people to come and meet with Jesus, but the strongest one of them all is that we may be afraid. Afraid of rejection. Afraid that they may say no. But actually, if we are faithful disciples, the, the yes and the no from the people we invite shouldn't worry us. 
We are postmen given an invitation to deliver. Our job is to pass it on. How people respond to the invitation is really between them and God. It's not the job of the postman, is it? To decide not to deliver our mail because he thinks we won't like it. We'd be pretty mad if we found out that our postman was doing that for us. In fact, in this country, the postman would be committing a criminal offence if he did so. He could go to jail. It's that important that the post gets through. And can you imagine if when Jesus described the kingdom of God as like a great banquet to which he invited all of his neighbours, if in that he included a line about the servants who were so afraid that they simply didn't go and deliver the invitations. How mad would the master have been then? But Jesus did not include that line. In his story, he trusts his servants to be faithful in their duty. And when people say no and break his heart, his servants are ready at his bidding to go back out again and again and again until no matter how many say no, the banqueting table is full to overflowing with those who say yes. Because that's what God wants. That is God's heart that his servants do not hesitate, that the invitations go out and his party is buzzing with those who say yes. You have that invitation in your basket, so to speak. Will you deliver it? But in the basket too, you also have a story to tell, your story. Your story that, like Paul's, begins with the life, death and resurrection of Jesus and then kicks off into the next chapter with, and last of all, he appeared to me. It's a story not just of a historical Jesus, but a living, present saviour and a friend who continues to change our lives today. And stories, you know, are very in at the moment. Just look at the shelves stocked with magazines and newspapers, all full of stories. The magazines pay good money for your story. Why? Because stories sell. That's what people long to read. And then look at the bookshops stocked with biographies and, and watch popular television programmes and think what they are made up of. People's stories. Telling your story is very much in vogue. And that's true of faith stories too. Not so long ago, when I was minister in Warrington, we began to encourage people to, to share their stories by running a series of songs of praise services that were introduced by the person, and they told us why the hymn was important to them. Some people, however, had great difficulty in choosing a hymn, not because they didn't want to take part in the service, but because they couldn't narrow their choice down to just one. I could choose five, they said. Well, go on then, I replied. And we began to run a series of services in which, uh, a bit like Desert Island Discs, I interviewed one person about their faith, their life and their work. The whole series structured around the hymns that they had chosen. And you know, the regular congregation in that church for a Sunday evening service when I preached was then about 20 people. When it was one of these services, the building would be full, 80 to 100 people. Why? Because people love to hear other people's stories. And we've all got a story to tell. Yes, we have. I know many of us think we haven't. Uh, one man I asked to take part in that series responded, as many do, by saying, but I haven't got a story worth telling. Uh, no dramatic uh, conversion, no skeletons in the closet, no terrible past. I just always seem to have gone to church. A bit boring, really. <laughs> but I told him that was exactly why I wanted him to share his story. Yes, we'd heard from the elder who'd revealed he'd done time in his youth for drug dealing. We, we heard from the woman who came back to faith after being um, caught up in the IRA bombing in Warrington. And we even heard of a woman who'd been stabbed and left for dead by the side of the canal. 
These were fascinating and powerful stories, but not all of us have stories like that. This man's story was simple and mundane, but powerful nonetheless. He told quite simply how over the course of years the story of Jesus had come to mean so much to him and how faith in Jesus had inspired him, how he had found God with him, giving him strength and making a real difference in his life, his ordinary life. And many people could relate to that. We've all got a story to tell. We may be helped to frame it and tell it in a way that emphasises the way the story of Jesus intersects with our story. That would help so that people could see that it's the difference he made in the person's life that's important. As evangelist, I can help you with that. It's part of my job, and I'm glad to do it. Because if you know and love Jesus, well, you have a story to tell. You also have in your basket a prayer to offer. I was reminded recently of an event in Cheltenham at which the magician, speaking at the time, took a break from his tricks and, and spoke about one way he believed we could all share in evangelism. He spoke about uh, D.L. Moody, who made it his daily task to pray for 100 of his friends. By the time he died, 96 of them had become Christians, and the other four, it is said, were converted at his funeral. Well, that's some story. But I don't know about you, the idea of praying every day for a hundred people is a bit more than I can comprehend. But maybe I can manage one or two. A few more at a squeeze. What about you? Don't underestimate the importance and the power of prayer. I mentioned how I can give training and so often people tell me it's training that they need, but I beg to differ. It's not that training is not helpful, it's that there is something more vital, something more effective. Prayer. Prayer is where we tune into the life and energy of God. A person who is a praying person is a person who will be energised with the life of God. When I first met a group of praying Christians, I instantly sensed something in them that I hadn't got. That meant that when they spoke to me of Jesus and of the Holy Spirit living in them, their words were full of power and they were full of authenticity. Their story chimed with the ring of truth. Their invitation seemed the only way to go. All that because they'd been living in a vital relationship with God through prayer. And their prayer that I might come to faith was heard. So you have an invitation. You have a story, you have prayer in your basket. You also have an authentic life to live. A friend of mine was telling me with much surprise of a, a conversation he had with a colleague at work. Out of the blue, he received an invitation from this colleague to go to his baptism. And he just really couldn't understand why. So he asked his colleague about it, and he asked what was it that made him want to be baptised? And the answer humbled my friend because the colleague's answer was simply one word. You. My friend's stunned silence prompted a fuller answer as his colleague went on to talk about a time a, a few months earlier in the office when they were joking around, as men in the office sometimes do, talking about their ideal woman. They named uh, film stars like Jennifer Aniston and, and models and the like, and they said they'd have this bit that was Jennifer Aniston and that bit that was somebody else. Uh, when they asked my friend, all he could say was, well, honestly, guys, I've been married to Janice for 20-odd years. And I can honestly say that there's no question, but she is my ideal woman. You know, my friend didn't even remember saying that. But something of his integrity and the fact that his colleague knew he was a Christian sent this other man off on a journey of inquiry. 
that led to his eventual coming to faith and baptism. And finally, there's, I hope, in your basket, a readiness to explain. If there's one scripture verse that I want a synod evangelist to, to bring to you and to the churches throughout the synod, it has to be this one from 1 Peter chapter 3. Be ready at all times to answer anyone who asks you to explain the hope that you have in you. Our lives, it seems, should be of such a quality that people start asking questions. That is challenge number one. But challenge number two is that when they ask, we should be ready to give an answer. We need to be able to talk the talk as well as walk the walk. It's my job to do that. It's also my job to, to help encourage you to be ready to do the same. How can we do that? Most of us, I think, don't feel ready. Even though why, after going to church for so many years, why we're not ready, I just don't understand. How have we as church leaders failed so drastically in preparing our people to meet this most basic task? I don't know the answer to that. But I do want to point something out straight away. Being ready to answer anyone who asks you to explain the hope that you have within you is not the same thing as knowing all the answers. And it doesn't mean that you will have all the answers. I'm sure there are answers to some of your questions. But I also know that for the most part, the life of faith involves living with the big questions, not necessarily answering them. I'd go as far as saying that the life of faith enables us to live with the questions. Because underneath all of that uncertainty are the everlasting arms of God. Loving, gracious arms that we've seen most clearly stretched out upon the cross. The strong, holding arms of Jesus that enable us, despite all our doubts and questions, to live in a sure and certain hope. One of the most poignant hymns I know is that one that begins each verse with the line, I cannot tell. But the chorus each time counteracts that with the line, but this I know. Perhaps more than anywhere, we need to remember where we started today. With Jesus not asking for what we haven't got, but for what we have got. Are we ready to share what the good news means to us? So that is the picnic box. The picnic box that you have. It, it may not appear much, but can I remind you of the main point of this passage? That when a pathetic picnic is placed in the hands of Jesus, he can do amazing things with it. The disciples thought that they would never have enough, that they just didn't have what it takes to feed that hungry crowd. In a very real way, they were right. What they hasn't had wasn't enough until it was given over to Jesus. Then they saw an incredible demonstration of what God can do with the little that we have, if only we make it available to him. Five loaves, two fishes, a pathetic little picnic indeed. But that was more than enough to feed the hungry crowd when put in the hands of Jesus. Let's not forget this miracle-working God is still with us. And let's trust our little to him, that he may do wonders with it, so that those who are hungry for life and those who are hungry for God may feast and be satisfied. Amen.